All right, this thing was on. Yeah, okay, it's still on. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. I hope everyone's doing well. It's great to see you all. My name is Pastor John. I'm Associate Pastor of Family Discipleship here at FBC Tavares. We've got Pastor Morgan back today, so that's great. We're going to be continuing on. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to be uh, continuing on in our study in Revelation, so we are definitely excited about that. We are also excited to announce our first small group fair is going to be today in Fellowship Hall directly following service. So we're going to kick that off around 1030. Uh, as you guys leave, if you're able, please stop by, check it out, uh, talk to a leader, see how you can get plugged in uh, and kind of go from there. This is something that uh, we believe very strongly in Christian community and the developing relationships in smaller groups. So please check that out today as you leave. A couple of, of other quick announcements. Precept is starting later on this week, the 23rd of August. It starts at 1. We're going to be walking through the Gospel of Mark, so please be in prayer for that this semester as we move through it. Additionally, Awana officially starts this week on the 24th of August, so that's Wednesday night. Drop-off for that is at 545, so if you have little ones or grandchildren who come, it is 545 drop-off for that one additional announcement that is not in the bulletin as of yet. Uh, this was actually brought to me relatively recently, but we have partnered with um, a, an organization called FCA. Some of you guys might be aware. It's uh, an organization that helps with uh, reaching our students, particularly athletes, for Christ. And so what we're going to be doing is uh, over the next three to four weeks, we're hoping to collect as many 12-ounce Gatorades as we can. They sell these at Walmart in 12 packs for like $7. And so we, what we want to do is we want to get as many of these as we can, and we want to take them to the high school and donate them to the students in a way to better serve them and bring Christ to our community through that. So if you're able, please uh, bring those. We're going to start having, uh, we'll have a bin, excuse me, in the lobby in the, uh, near the office area and then also in the fellowship hall starting next week to collect those and then we will gather them all and take them to the high school and be able to share the gospel through giving out some, well, not cold water, but giving out some, some Gatorade. So. All right, uh, finally, if you are new or visiting with us today, please fill out that Connect card uh, in your bulletin. We'd love to have a record of your visit and to be able to connect with you. Um, you can drop that off in any of our offering stations once you've, get that, once you've got that filled out. In addition, we do have online giving available as well. Please stand with us. We're going to sing At the Cross, hymn number 139. Oh, uh -huh. 
Father, Lord, thank you so much for this day. Lord, thank you for your love. Lord, thank you for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for the ability to worship and praise you in your holy name. Lord, thank you that Pastor Morgan is back safely, Lord, and going to bring us your word. Lord, we love you. In your holy name we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let us now sing Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. It is hymn number 208 in your hymnals. scripture reading this morning will be taken out of the book of Revelation chapter 19 verses 9 and 10. This is the angel that John has been conversing with speaking to him and chapter 19 verse 9 says and he said unto me right blessed are they which are called into the marriage supper of the lamb and he said unto me these are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See that you do it not, for I am your fellow servant, and of my brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for all that you do for us, for your love that you give to us. And we thank you, Lord, that you have revealed yourself to us through your word, and that through this testimony that you've given us, we can learn more about you, more about Christ. This morning, I ask, Lord, that you would allow each and every one of us to be illuminated by your spirit as we study your word. I pray that you would give to each and every person here what they need to be closer to you, and that, Lord Jesus, you would be praised, honored, and have your way all in all. And it's in Christ's name we pray and ask all these things God's people said. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the remainder of the service. The choir has prepared for you a hymn called Wonderful Grace of Jesus. Hope you enjoy it.
that is one of my favorite songs. Wonderful grace of Jesus. I've always enjoyed that. I've always enjoyed not just the melody of it, but even the message that is in that song. So if you have your Bibles, let's open to Revelation chapter 19, and we'll be starting in verse number 1 this morning uh, as we look at the Word of God together. Now with that being said, I want to draw your attention for just a moment to an article uh, that came out a few years ago, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, something to that effect, and I clipped it and I saved it because I thought how relevant this article is. It was in the news at this time, but what it did is it represented that something that happens every few years and the Christian community kind of, kind of just bites into it and believes it. And I don't really want to use this word. It's not everybody, but for a large part of the Christian community, they're a little gullible to when someone does what I'm about to read. And I remember this article that came out in 2018, uh, that there was a numerologist by the name of David Mead. He predicted that the world would end on that year at April the 23rd. He said that believers will be sent to heaven while non-believers will die over the next five months. This became such a huge article that major networks started to pick this up. You would have seen this on Fox News and other places as well. And it's not necessarily that they believed it, but that they were saying, here are the Christians again predicting the date that Christ comes and that the world will end. And of course, you had other Christian believers standing up and saying things that were very true and very real, such as these predictions are not consistent with the biblical stories. Everything Meade said about April 23rd, he said last year. And sure enough, if you went back and researched, what you found is that seemingly every year, the same individual would predict the date that Jesus is going to come back. And Christians would say things such as, I wish that they would stop saying these things and stop scaring people. And that is a very true statement, but yet it happens over and over again. Now, the thing that happened about 10 years ago, or probably the last year I was living in Arkansas, there was a man by the name of Camping. And that was his last name. And what he did, he lives in, I think it was Oakland, California. And he started taking up a campaign saying, send us money so that we can warn people that his name was Harold Camping, that the end of the world is coming. And so billboards started getting scattered all across the United States predicting a day that the world was going to end, that Jesus was going to come back. That date was May 21st. It was a Saturday night, actually, that this uh, prediction was supposed to come true. And I remember laying in my bed on Saturday night, getting ready to preach the next morning, thinking, I wonder how many people are going to be disturbed by this right now. And people sent millions of dollars, sold their homes, sold their assets, sold their retirements, uh, or give away their retirements, sold their vehicles, so that this person could put up billboards all across America. Now, I remember in Little Rock, the billboards were up with that date, saying, the end of the world is coming on this day, be prepared. And that day came, and that day went, and Sunday was the next day. And we, as a typical church, had Sunday school, and then our uh, 10, and then our normal service at 11. And of course, Sunday school usually ran less than the morning service did. But on that Sunday, we had the largest attendance in Sunday school ever. Because people came to say, did we miss the rapture? <laughs> and that's a true story. Like, I almost really and truly wanted to just play a little joke and show up 10 minutes late <laughs> just to see what everybody would do. But these things happen over and over and over again. And when I say this, I don't mean this again to be um, uh, nasty or mean in the way I say it. Many times Christian people become a little bit gullible in what it is that they believe when it doesn't line up with the world of God. I remember, uh, I think it was 1988, 88 reasons Jesus will return in 1988, and then he didn't come back, and so he writes the sequel, 89 reasons that Jesus will come in 1989. How many strikes do you get before you're out is the question, right? When the Bible clearly says that no man knows the day or the hour that Christ will return. And you can go through and you can read, and, and, and in addition to all the cults who have wrongly predicted it, the book of Deuteronomy says that if someone makes a prediction in the name of a prophet, it doesn't come true, do not fear them. Or in other words, don't listen to a word that they have to say. Because if they say they're speaking for God and it doesn't come true, do not reverence that person. If it was the Old Testament economy, they would be stoned to death. 
and that kind of cuts down on people that are fighting for the job position, right? 1997, Richard Noon predicted in his book, Ice, the Ultimate Disaster, when the world was going to end on May 5th in the year 2000. How many of you remember Y2K, right? Another apocalypse, it's coming. Uh, 2007, evangelical Christian leader Pat Robertson said a month and year at the end of the world, and then he did it several times. September 2009, uh, the Large Hadron Collider fired up, leading to the speculation that the world's biggest atom smasher would create a black hole that would swallow the earth. 2015, Chris McMahon, the leader of the E-Bible Fellowship Group, he said a day, and all these things failed to happen. Here's the point that I'm trying to say as we start the book of Revelation. If we understand what the Bible is saying... We don't have to worry, or we don't have to be fooled, or we don't have to worry about being taken astray by predictions that people make. Because if we understand the truth of the Word of God, we will be okay. So with that being said, we're going to look at the first ten verses, and we're going to explore it in this manner, and I hope that it will help you. Firstly, and this is part one of dealing with Armageddon, the what, the what. Okay, now the what is going to deal with all the information about this event called Armageddon. Because if you don't understand correctly what the Bible says about that event, then you will, like the Apostle Paul says to the Ephesians, be blown about by every wind of doctrine. Like a tumbleweed that isn't rooted deeply, when the wind blows in a certain direction, you'll be picked up and you'll be carried with it. So the what this morning, if you'll allow me a few minutes to speak about a part of this that is highly informational, and it's just going to be, so hang on with me and understand the things that we're teaching. And after we give you the what, some of you undoubtedly and rightfully so would say, so what? Now that you've told me all of this about it, what does that have to do with me if I'm not going to be there? Well, good news, this very same passage tells you, so what, what it means to you. And then lastly, the now what, now that you know what it means to you, what in the world do you do in response to the what that we've talked about concerning Armageddon. So we've got a lot ahead of us. Let's go ahead and dive in for a minute, and let's talk about the what. Let's, first point, get our bearings together about what this place is and what it's all about. Now, you've encountered it in the Bible many times if you've read it, and it's came under different names. But it's important because each name gives a specific aspect of what is going to happen and what does happen in this area. We call it an event, but really it's an area of Armageddon. The first most recognizable name that you would remember is in chapter 16 and verse number 16 in Revelation. You could turn back just a couple of pages and you read this in the Word of God. And he, being God, gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. That is a place. Not an event necessarily, but a place. Now, what does Armageddon mean? It's made up of two words. First, har, which means mountain, and the next, megiddo, which means slaughter. So now, if you're thinking about this, why would a valley, which is where the valley of Armageddon is going to take place, be called a mountain? Well, this will make sense in a moment. If you have a valley, then to John, it makes sense, and it'll make sense to you. To have a valley, you must be surrounded by mountains. And truly, that area is. So, Har means mountain, Megiddo means slaughter. That name is important because a lot of slaughter has happened in this area, and a lot of slaughter will happen in this area at a time to come. Now, just as a side note, when someone asks where you live, how would you like to say the city of slaughter? (laughs) Needless to say, Disney is not about to open a park there, right? The valley called Armageddon. Now, secondly, you've come across it here. If you've read the book of Joel and you've been in chapter 3, and and for sake of time, I want to take you, we're not going to be able to go and read every reference, but in Joel chapter 3, at verse number 2, verses 12 and 13, you start to see another reference or another name to this valley, and its name also has a specific meaning. I'll read one verse, Joel 3, 2, I will gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. 
So it's called the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Now, what does that word mean? That word means God judges. Jehoshaphat was the king of the south, the son of the king Asa, which I named my youngest child after. And the name means where God judges because it will be in this place that God is going to judge the world at the return of Jesus Christ. And again, in Ezekiel 39, verse 11, we have another name for this area. But the name also means something very specific to the reader. In Ezekiel 39, verse 11, Ezekiel says, It will come to pass in that day, I will give unto Gog a place there of graves in Israel. And here's the phrase, The valley of the passengers on the east of the sea. So it's also called the valley of passengers. Now, why is it called the Valley of Passengers? Well, it is because from this place, the Via Maris ran. That was a tremendously large trade route that went from Egypt up to Syria. And that Har Megiddo, that mountain uh, that we spoke about, and another mountain, Mount Tabor, were mountains that actually guarded that pass for a very important reason. It let people in. It let people through. Because if you guarded this major trade route, you got to tax whoever it was that went through. And so you had a lot of power if you controlled this area. So it's called the Valley of Passengers because almost everyone has to pass through this area. Do you remember one of the phrases I read in Joel? I will bring all nations into this area. The people are going to come there, many people. Back into Joel chapter 3, verses 13 through 14. Here it is called the Valley of Decision. And that name itself also means something very, very important. Let me read what Joel says in chapter 3 and verse 13. Speaking of this event, it should sound familiar. Put in the sickle, the harvest is ripe, the wickedness is great. Verse 14, multitudes and multitudes are going to be in the valley of the decision for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. So the reason it is called the valley of decision because it will be here that God makes the decision to no longer defer or hold back the grace. Think of, uh, think of rushing waters and a dam. The dam is the grace that holds back the judgment. But it will be here that that dam is broken down and, and the grace will no longer hold back the judgment of God that will come on the earth at this time in this place. And then the last name, there's a few more, but of importance, Joshua 17, 16. Back, way back in the Old Testament, Moses' successor, it is called the Valley of Jezreel because, again, another reference to a trade route. Instead of north-south, it is east and it is west. And this place has always had a particular interest whenever you read the Bible under all of these different names. It is here that Israel should have taken this part of the land because God said, Go get it. It's yours. Defeat them and take it. But the Israelis got scared because they had chariots made of iron. And the Israelis did not have iron yet. To put it in perspective, that's like you carrying a bow and arrow to fight an army that has tanks. Instead of trusting God, they kind of backed off of this place. But again, this trade route references the world will come at a crossroads between the most important roads in the area, north, south, east, and west. God said, I will bring all nations here. So I want you to think as we get our bearings together about the terrain of this place. Now stick with me just for a few more moments. I told you the first will be highly informational. Get this and then we'll apply it, okay? Depending on where you mark the boundaries of this, if you take in some of the mountains, it's approximately 1,000 square miles of terrain. To put it in another way, it's going to be a battlefield that is at least the size of Rhode Island. Now you're starting to figure out how you're going to get a lot of people in that area, right? (laughs) Because you can't just measure the valley. Because whenever you read through this, what you're going to see is Zechariah will make references that uh, that this part, uh, which is Megiddo, is the north of Israel. When he speaks of Jerusalem, that's the middle of Israel. And when he speaks of Judah, that's south of Israel. And then Isaiah sees the Lord at this time coming from today, modern-day Jordan. Well, that, that is outside of the land of Israel. It's not just going to be all compacted into one little plain. That'll be the magnet that where everyone is drawn to. But it'll be a tremendous battle that goes 
all throughout this part of the world. So it's going to be a tremendous battlefield that is put before us. Now, as you come to this plain, this valley surrounded by mountains, is surrounded by mountains on each side. And again, if you have read the Bible, studied the Bible you'll recognize all the significant events that have happened in this. To the west is Mount Carmel. That is where Elijah had a showdown with the prophet of Baal, and fire came from heaven, and the entire nation saw revival, and 400 prophets of Baal were killed that day. And to the west of this area, these great events happened. Up to the north are the mountains of Nazareth. Jesus, when he was a 12-year-old boy, was teaching the doctors and the scribes in the temple when they would come back for the Passover and the pilgrim feasts. And as a little boy, if Jesus could teach the doctors and the scribes, no doubt, when he looked out over the cliff from his home and he saw this valley, he not only understood everything that has happened in it in the Old Testament, he understood that his ultimate destiny in his return to take the kingdom in his hand physically and to hold on it, onto it forever, it'll play a major role right here in this valley that he could overlook almost every day of his life. If you were to go to the east, Mount Mora and Tabor were there. This is where God sent flash floods to defeat the Canaanites and sink their iron chariots for Barak and Deborah uh, down into the ground where they couldn't move. And to the south, Mount Gilboa, where Saul was killed uh, in the mountains of Samaria, or rather Saul leaned on his sword because he'd been struck with a fatal arrow by the Philistines. All of these things have happened here. Deborah Barak defeated the Canaanites. Gideon defeated the Midianites. Judges 7, the Philistine killed Saul, or he fell on his sword, 1 Samuel 31. Uh, Ahaziah was killed by Jehu. Josiah was slain by Pharaoh. Kings have battled. Jezebel was killed, 2 Kings 9. Jews, Gentiles, the Crusaders, Christian, French, anti-Christian Frenchmen, Egyptians, Persians, Turks, Arabs have all fought here. And Marvin Vincent, the great New Testament word theologian, said, every nation under heaven has pitched their tents on this plain and has had the banner of their flags wet with the dew from Mount Tabor and Hermon. Perhaps the two most recent things about this area that you remember from history is World War I British General Allenby led his army to defeat the Turks on this very plain and there they gained as really the world power from the Turks. And Napoleon said all the armies of the world could maneuver their forces on this vast plain. Quoting Napoleon, he said, There is no place in the world more suited for war than this. It is the most natural battleground on the whole earth. And so most scholars can count up to 200 battles that have happened on this very valley. As we mentioned earlier, the prophets are very clear. It's not just in this valley. It's going to be all up and down this land. So point one, we gather our bearings about what happens here. Point number two Gathering for battle. Who are the participants in this particular battle? Well, here are the first participants. And we're going to look in Zechariah chapter 14 and verse number 2. And, and you listen and tell me if you can pick out who the participants are here. Zechariah 14 two says, I will gather all nations. Okay, anybody have a hint on what, who might be participating? <laughs> If you said all nations, you're correct. All nations will be gathered. So someone will ask, is that literally every single nation, a third world nation without an army, or is it just representation for everyone who has a beef in the game? I don't know, and it doesn't matter because in Matthew 25, who is not at war, they will pass before the Lord. And you, this is what you remember, I will put the sheep on my right hand and put the goats on my on my left hand, and the sheep will enter into the kingdom. The ghosts will enter into eternal destructions. So no one will escape the all-seeing, judging eye of Christ in this time. But for this battle, all nations will be gathered. Let's just take it for what it says. Now, who else will be here? We'll look at verse 14 of Revelation 19, skipping ahead for just a moment. And the armies which were in heaven followed him, who is him, Christ Jesus, upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now, what you want to do there with armies is draw a circle around it and write, that's me and that's you, if that's a believer, if you're a believer. 
You know who else is going to be involved in Armageddon? All of the nations of the world. But following out of heaven are the armies. And seeing what they're clothed in gives away exactly who these are. Because you'll see in a moment that it is the bride that is wearing these fine linens. And of course, leading that charge out of heaven on the white horse is our Lord Jesus Christ. So all nations, Jesus, you and me will be a part of this. So you say, okay, so I'm going to get to fight in this war. Well, the answer is no. You're coming to be a spectator. Jesus is going to do all the work. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, look in uh, verse 13 of Revelation 19. Verse 13 says, And he was clothed with a vesture, dipped in blood, and his name is called the War Word of God. Skip to verse 15. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations and rule them with a rod of iron. You see, you're not doing much there, but Jesus is the one that's doing everything there. Let me give you a couple of more scriptures that I think will make that very clear, and then... Very soon we'll move on to some applications, but I want you to get this with me, okay? Daniel chapter 2 and verse number 45. Daniel has had the dream about the statue, remember? And the statue represents all of the coming kingdoms in Daniel's day. And at the very end, there is, verse 45 says, a stone that was cut out of the mountain, listen to this phrase, without hands. And it rolled down and it break all of the kingdoms of the world. And then that allowed the kingdom of the stone or the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ, to be set up. So what does it mean cut without hands? That means nobody had anything to do with this. It was Christ himself who did it all. Now, if you think that's not clear enough, let me give you one more reference to make sure that we don't miss for sure uh, what is being said. And that would be in Isaiah chapter 63 and verse 5. And this is Jesus speaking to, uh, in this event to a, a Jewish believer. And this is what Jesus said. Listen to the words of Christ in the Old Testament. And I looked, and there was none to help. And I marveled, or I wondered, that there was none to uphold. Therefore, my own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury it upheld me. I will tread down the people in mine anger and make them drunk in my fury. And I will bring down their strength to the earth. So the participants may be Christ. All the nations may be gathered there. We will be following him out of heaven. But the one who is going to make war is going to be Jesus Christ and him alone. Now I want to give you one more uh, grain of Sugar to throw in your gas tank and really mess your theology up, okay? <laughs> Look at Zechariah 12, 8, or rather let me listen to it. There'll be one more participant in the war, okay? Zechariah chapter 12, verse 8 says this. Reading the word of God. And in that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So far, so good. But keep reading. And he that is feeble among them in that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, and the angel of the Lord before them. Now, what in the world does that mean? Well, let me tell you. Who is Israel's greatest warrior in their mind? King David. And when the Lord returns, the sight of his return... If you keep reading through Zechariah 12 through 14, what you'll find is the city will be invaded. Half of it will be taken. It says the houses will be plundered by the Antichrist and his armies. It says that the women will be ravished, that two-thirds of the population will be killed. It will not be a great time for that nation. But when in their fear and feebleness they see the Lord return, Jesus Christ is going to grant them strength that the weakest of them becomes like the greatest of them, and they will be protected by God during this time. So will they participate? Yep, some way, somehow. And this blessed hope is what Roman 8 talks about, the groaning that all of this stuff will come to be because when this happens, the world is finally set back right to be how it ought to be. Now, I want to help you with two things here, and and all of this is really about to wrap up pretty quick, okay? But if we're coming from heaven, that means we all have to get to heaven before we return with Christ, right? 
Now, let me give you just a few things here. What is the difference between the event we call the rapture and the event we call Armageddon? Things that we find in the scripture. Okay, here's the first one. In the rapture, saints go to heaven. In Armageddon, saints return from heaven. In the rapture, we're going to the wedding supper. Uh, in Armageddon, we're presented as the bride of Christ. In the rapture, it's imminent. That means it can happen any time. Armageddon, there must be things that happen first, like the tribulation and the Antichrist to be revealed. The rapture is not in the Old Testament. That's why the Apostle Paul said in Romans 15, Behold, I show you a mystery, a truth you haven't figured out yet. We shall not all die, uh, we sh but uh, we will all be changed. Now, they all, the new truth wasn't resurrection. That was taught in Daniel, Isaiah, Job. The new truth was the rapture of the church. We're not all going to die. Christ is going to come back and take us out. The rapture happens before the day of wrath. Armageddon concludes the day of wrath. The rapture, he comes in the air, and in Armageddon, he comes to earth. And the rapture concludes the church age. Armageddon concludes the time of the tribulation. Now, if you want some more teaching about this, parables can be found in Matthew 13 and the end of Matthew 24 and Matthew 25. But now let's move to the so what because we're running out of time. I've told you a lot about Armageddon. So what? All right, I'm glad you asked. I'm going to tell you what. Look at verse number 1 in Revelation 19. All right, heaven is rejoicing. And if heaven is rejoicing over this, don't you think it would be good for God's people to follow their cue? <laughs> Do you know why they're rejoicing? They know what this means. So many of God's people don't know what it means. So many say, well, we can't understand it. We can't be blessed. They believe this. We believe that. And I'm not against anybody who believes anything different. Believe me. But when you understand it, it's rejoice worthy instead of sitting with a question mark over your head. Listen to what they say. Verse 1, they're rejoicing because salvation and glory are being given to the victor, capital V. That's Christ. And after these things, I heard a great voice and much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. By the way, interesting enough, that word hallelujah, it's only used here in the New Testament in Revelation. Filled in the Old Testament, but only here in the New Testament. What an expression of praise when you understand what is happening. They get it. I hope you get it too. They're rejoicing because he, Christ, has now judged every enemy of man. Verse 2 and 3. True and righteous are his judgments. He has judged the great whore. That was the false religious system that corrupted the earth with her fornication and has avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Hallelujah! And her smoke rose up forever and ever. Well, they get it. Every enemy of mankind, every enemy that stood in front of the truth has been judged by Jesus Christ. No more deception, no more wrong. All the enemies of truth have now been judged. But they're not done worshiping. Look at verse 4 and 5. They understand that this event is about to set everything right. Look at verse 4. And the 24 elders and the four beasts, if you remember back in Revelation 4, around the throne, uh, they, they fell and they worshipped. And, and saying, verse 4, hallelujah. Verse 5, out of the throne came a voice saying, praise God, all you servants, all that fear him, small and great. So they're rejoicing because he's setting everything right. And they're rejoicing in verse number 6 because he has the power to set everything right. Now listen. I want to ask you an honest question. If you had the power to change anything you wanted with the thought, how different would some things be? <laughs> Amen. But there's someone here who does have that power. And listen to what verse 6 says. They belong to the one who has that power. I heard, as it were, a great voice, the voice of many waters, a mighty voice like thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent. That means all-powerful. No limit in the power that he has. He reigns. You know, he always reigns as if he's in control of everything that happens. But in this way, he is manifesting, manifesting, inflicting, so to speak. It won't be an affliction to believers. It'll be a time of rejoicing. His will on the earth. And on all creation. They're rejoicing because of this. 
And we should be rejoicing, and they're rejoicing because the bride is about to be revealed unto the world. Now look at verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. Now again, if you like marking in your Bible the wife, you can circle that, and you can put that's me and that's you if you're a believer. And she was granted, she didn't earn it, she was granted that she should be arrayed in white linen. How was that granted? Through the salvation provided by Jesus Christ. Clean and white are the fine linen and the righteousness of the saints. And he said to me, Right blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And the angel said unto me, these are the true sayings of God. Now I want you to stop for a minute and back up and think about this. I really don't think you're getting it or I'm getting it like the people in heaven are getting it. And John got it. You see, the world is not a good place. Have you figured that out? (laughs) You're sick, you're hurt, people are mean, life's cruel, it's not fair, it's unjust, it's this, it's that, it's other. It's never going to change. It's going to be that way till Christ returns. There's going to be things that fight against us. Nothing works for us. Every time you go to put your hand to the plow to do whatever type of work that you do, it doesn't come easy. It, it, things you think should be easy. Why does it take twice as long to do something that you think it should take? It is because the world is not a great place. They're killing each other all over the place. Here people are starving. There people are stealing. Here people are murdering. Here people are buying drugs and selling them and manufacturing and, and babies are being killed and this, that, and the other. The the earth is not a good place. And understand what it's going to be like when everything is perfect. When everything is without any affliction, no fears, no tears, no anxiety, no heartache, nothing that plagues you, no migraines, no knee aches, no back aches. When the world is perfect to understand everything that plagues you is gone, that is almost I mean, we, we, it, it, by hope, we hold on to it, and we believe it. It's our confession, but doesn't it almost, we do believe it, but we act like it's too good to be true. And as John is hearing, okay, Christ is coming, he's, he's all-powerful, God is going to set everything right, the angel has to look at him and say, John, it's really happening. These are the true words of God. It's going to happen. It's coming. Some people outside of the church say, well, we don't want to believe that Christ is coming back. It doesn't matter. These are the true words of God. They're coming. So John is assured. Now, we're about to come to the end. We're still at the so what. Well, heaven gets it. You need to get it too. When Christ comes at this event, it won't be good for his enemies, but it will be good for the future of the world. Now, what you see here in this event You may ask this question. I want to answer it for you. You say, well, if Christ is going to do that, why doesn't he do it right now? That's a good question, isn't it? But I can answer that question. He's following a plan, and he's given us a plan. Do you know what? I'm going to be willing to bet that you don't know, because I wouldn't know if I wasn't a pastor paid to study this, how a Jewish wedding went 2,000 years ago on the other side of the world. Willing to bet you wouldn't know that. You know, so uninterested in weddings was I that I did my best to not go to them at all when I was a child. <laughs> Fake mean, a headache, whatever you got. It's so boring. They get up there, they cry, they sing a song, they look each other in the eyes. Now, all the ladies like it, but a seven, eight-year-old boy, I'm watching all that thinking, when is this going to end, you know? And the only wedding I've ever been interested in was my own, and I was so uninterested in other weddings at the time that I didn't know you weren't supposed to walk up the middle aisle, so the music played. You know, at rehearsal, you start on the stage, right? And when the music started, I didn't know that was reserved for the bride. I just walked up and got on stage. So, yeah, I don't know a lot about weddings, okay? But most of you do. And if you lived 2,000 years ago in Israel, what you know about weddings today is the same thing that If you were living then, you would know about them then. And this is how a wedding worked. Firstly, and Jesus and the apostles lay it out and follow this plan for you. And you'll recognize probably every one of these scriptures. The wedding started with the betrothal stage, betrothal. And there, it's not like an engagement. It was more official. You actually uh, had to have a a written divorcement to, to break that. A lot more serious than an engagement. And the way that started was that the father picked out a bride... And then the son went to that bride and paid a dowry or a purchase price. 
And Jesus came to the bride's home, the earth, and he paid that price. As 1 Corinthians 6 and 7 says, you're not your own. You're bought with the price, bought with the precious blood of Christ. Then, after that, the groom would turn and he would go back to his father for an undetermined amount of time. Usually it was about one year. And what he would do, he would go to prepare a place called the bridal chamber. And remember what Jesus said in John chapter 14, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for And then where I am in heaven, that's where he is after the ascension, I will come again and where I am, heaven, there will you be also. And so the groom would go away, prepare that bridal chamber, and that's where we are right now. Why hasn't God fixed it yet? He's preparing the place for us. He told us the plan. Then the groom would come at an unannounced time. It was usually about a year. And at the unannounced time, he would send an entourage or an escort with him, and they would all go before him saying, Behold, the bridegroom comes! And they would shout out into the city. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, we're told Jesus has the same thing. Uh, Therefore the Lord himself shall send from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the... That's, that's, that's his entourage, saying, Behold, we surmise something like, To the church, the bridegroom comes... He comes. And what's interesting is he never goes into her home. He waits outside of the home, and she's brought out to him. The Lord will descend from heaven. He won't set foot on the earth. He waits in the clouds, and we ascend up to him in the clouds, according to 1 Thessalonians 4. Then he makes a procession with her back to the Father's house. And even according to the Jewish standard encyclopedia, in the hoopah, or the, in English, the bridal chamber, they would stay for seven days. Well, we also are in heaven during the time of tribulation. Can you give me a number of how many years that is? What was it? Do you remember? It's pretty amazing how God lined it all out, isn't it? And then after those seven days are over, then what happens is the bride comes out, still redressed in her her, uh, wedding garments with the groom, and she is unveiled. She is hid from the world for seven days, and then she is unveiled and presented to the world. It's what Paul says when Christ presents Uh, The bride without spot, without wrinkle, in her perfected glory and state, we come back to the world in Armageddon. So if you're wondering why God hasn't fixed all that yet, he told you his game plan. He told you his timeline. The the part we're in right now is an unexpected time. We're going to hear Michael yell. We're going to hear the trumpets blow. And then we're going to meet our Savior in the air. And it's going to be wonderful when that happens. So what? Now what? There's only one thing left to do when you understand that. Verse 10. This is an angel. This is an angel, and John is overwhelmed. He fell at his feet to worship. And the angel said, "Um, Don't do that. I'm your fellow servant. Uh, I am am your brethren that have the testimony of Jesus Christ. There's only one worthy of worship, and that is God. And that is why Jesus Christ received worship, because he is God. And that is why the Bible commands you not to worship angels, but yes, to worship Jesus, because Jesus is all deity, all God. That's what he is. We don't worship men. We don't worship angels. We worship God. And when you understand this, it's time to just do that. God, you really are fixing it. These are the true words of God. And it kind of brings us to the back door, back to chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed is he who reads and hears and keeps all of these sayings. So why did I take you to the Old Testament and, and give you all of these things? Well, look, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Anyone who says they don't need to know about certain parts of the word of God is missing the big picture. This book is the revelation, the whole book, not just... The whole Bible is the revelation of Jesus Christ is. If you want to know God, you don't know him better by sitting down in a chair, closing your eyes, getting in some trance, feeling something, and shaking your hands and say, I met with God. No, you had heartburn or something similar, I promise. If you want to know God, you open up this book, and when you know what this says about him, now you know who Christ is. As the musicians come at this time, we're to an end. Next week, we'll try not to be so uh, rapid fire in the approach, but I want you to understand 
I think this. I ask you to stand with me if you will. That these are the true words of God. And he is coming again. And the response to this is that we worship him. What is the Lord leading you to do this morning? Let him deal with your heart. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to very quick things to remind you of after the service remember there is a small group fair over in the fellowship hall so if you're not a part of one and you think that you might like to be you're not committed if you go but just walk over and see if there's any place that would interest you and also secondly we awanas is starting we did this last year worked fantastically and so we're going to ask to do it again last year we asked for every kid to have a sponsored prayer partner and uh, so there is a cost to one. And what we ask if anyone is willing to partner with a child and pray for that child through the course of Awanas, and if they would be willing to donate $20 towards that child's uh, Awanas time, then we ask that you would, or towards their expensive, we ask that you might do that because there's some big families that are coming to the event. I don't, don't pick my family, pick other families first. And do that for sure. So I'm not asking for me, but this is a tremendous benefit and a tremendous help uh, to these kids who come. Not all of them uh, have a great uh, source of income in their families. So consider that. If you would pray for them at the very least and maybe be a $20 sponsor that gets that child through the year. So if you want to do that, just speak to my wife in the back. She's going to be standing there watching everyone that goes by and taking notes. And mm-hmm, he didn't. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. That's a joke, okay? She's not going to be doing it. But she will be back there in case you want to, but I promise if that's not your calling, who am I to tell you to do something? It's the Holy Spirit that tells you what to do and not to, right? So let's be dismissed with the word of prayer and consider those two things. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for your grace, your love, and your mercy. And for everyone that came here on this day, I pray you would forgive our sins and our failures. Bless everyone who is here at this time. Help them to get something that you've given them to strengthen their life spiritually. We love you, and we thank you for all you do. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen.